formal work on the new uh, precariat published by um, Cornell University Press in 2015. Um, so you see that she has been busy, and um, we have had the pleasure of her participation in the Fanti Center Residence Scholars Program. And I was so glad when she um, uh, signed up for a second year, because in her first year, she was one of our really active and um, active citizens. Uh, she attended all of our sessions and had everything and had very important and profound things to say uh, for everybody's work. In fact, uh, uh, later this year she will be she will be presenting again. So she's also won one of our faculty fellowship awards and she's participated in several of our young talks uh, and uh, in our working group program. So I'd be very pleased if you would help me welcome to the podium uh, Professor Sarah Swider, who will talk to us today on race, space, and gender, African American women and entrepreneurs in Detroit's informal uh, economy. Please welcome her. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. I always feel good after he introduces me. I feel like we should just end there. <laughs> Um, okay, so I actually have a new title for the talk today, which is good news because it means that my ideas are even more refined since I gave the title originally. So the new title is Changing Spaces, Race, Ethnicity, and Gender in Detroit's Local Economy. Um, and I really, before I delve in, I want to thank Dr. Edwards and the Humanities Center because as he mentioned in his talk, in his introduction, uh, my, my, some of my first work has been on women workers and then I have spent a lot of time looking at men, uh, male workers, construction industry and in Asia. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to look more closely at women again, women in the economy, women as workers. And the reason I've had that opportunity is because of um, the Humanities Center's support. Uh, because I do still do work in China, so it's hard to balance those projects. And it's almost impossible, or it would be impossible, without the support that I have gotten and continue to get from the Humanities Center. And that really means a lot to me because it, um, this project is based in Detroit. And um, I feel like I am taking full advantage of being in such a dynamic, interesting place by having the opportunity um, to, to base some research here. So with that being said, let me delve in. So this is the outline of the talk, which really doesn't tell you much. I'm going to start by telling you why I'm looking at this, the beauty care industry. And then I will step back and talk a little bit about theory and thinking about race as a systemic phenomenon. And then from that, I'll discuss how the beauty care industry and the beauty salon actually becomes, is, is a kind of paradox in our society. And then I'll talk about methods and data, present some data, and give you some conclusions and implications. But really, um, that's, I think every single talk has this slide, right? It doesn't look different. It's almost interchangeable. But really, the, the article that I'm writing from which this talk is based is um, basically a simple story about the changing fate and space of uh, African American women in the beauty care industry in Detroit in one neighborhood. And that helps shed light on the role of race, ethnicity, gender, and space in shaping the local political economy. So I'm basically going to tell you uh, um, that story today. And the beauty care industry, the reason why I'm focusing on this beauty care industry is because it's a historically important industry, not only for creating jobs for African Americans, especially women, um, but it, it creates jobs that are better alternatives to the jobs that women are often um, funneled into in the main economy. Uh, it also is important 
the importance of this industry goes well beyond creating good alternative jobs for African Americans, especially women. Um, it's important because it has been the genesis of uh, wealth creation for African American communities. So women have um, actually created wealth and then taken that wealth and dumped it back into the community. So it's a really important source for wealth in the communities. And beyond that, um, and because it's also tied to uh, uh, African American leaders and power, these, these um, spaces become tied to them. But beyond that, these uh, salons and barbershops that are part of the beauty care industry in African American communities represent gendered spaces that have played a really important social and cultural role in the community um, for, many, um, for many of these African American communities. So this is a, a central uh, uh, industry for a number of reasons. Now, to tell my story, I'll use, I'm, I'm going to give you the short version so you know all the important stuff right up front, and then I'll get into the nitty gritty details. So to tell um, my story, I'm going to use, to tell the story about the changes in the beauty care industry in this neighborhood, which we call D-Town. It, it's a neighborhood in Detroit. I'll use three different sets of data to tell that story. So the first set of data I'll use to tell that story is our business, is our business license data um, that come from the state of Michigan. Um, and so they issue licenses for uh, both cosmetology, uh, individual licenses to women for cosmetology licenses. They also issue salons need to be licensed and barbershops need to be licensed. So I have that license data from the 70s until now. Um, for the city of Detroit, but I'm only presenting my, my neighborhood that I've looked at for this study today. The second set of, so that data, what that data shows is it shows that it, it, in previous decades, the beauty care industry represented by these salons and barbershops was thriving in this neighborhood. And the data shows how different the industry looks today and how over time the salons, which are mainly owned by African American women and staffed by African American women, and serving African American women have all but disappeared. At the same time, the data shows that um, the male owned barbershops that are owned by African American males, serving mainly African American males, have declined but still remain quite prominent in the neighborhood. And um, finally, while the salons and barbershops have, have experienced these changes, there's been a new organization or enterprise that has emerged which is called the braiding shop, which is very different because it's not licensed by the state. Um, it is usually owned by males, uh, African immigrant males, who are Senegalese males, um, and yet it's often staffed by women, the African American, I mean, sorry, not the African, the African immigrants from uh, Senegal, the women are usually the braiders, the men are the owners and managers, and these are not registered by, in, with the state. They don't have to be. And these have flourished during the same period. So, um, so the, the, given that the, the, these changes have occurred, the question is what happens to these African American women? Well, it turns out they don't just disappear. The licensing data shows that there's a large number of women in this neighborhood who continue to keep their individual licenses um, updated, so they're current, and you have to renew it every two years. And, and these women, um, and we know that people are using their services in the neighborhood because we have a different set of data, which is a survey we've been conducting on the informal economy in Detroit. This is the second set of data. And that one of the pieces of important data that comes out of that survey, um, which we concentrated in this neighborhood, shows that the most often, the most purchased service in the informal economy in this neighborhood is beauty care services. So we know the women are still providing the services and we know they're not in the salons anymore. So what's happened is they've changed places. They've changed spaces from storefronts to kitchen salons. And so the question then becomes, what caused them to shift from storefronts to the, the, the kitchen salons? And what are the uh, repercussions for that shift? And I have three, uh, for that data are interviews with women in the neighborhood who have done hair or did or still do hair in the neighborhood. And there are three emerging factors that explain that shift. And then the implications should be obvious because you know the role of the salon 
that it, because I just told you the important role that the salon has played in these neighborhoods. Well, their shifting spaces or changing spaces into the home, maybe it will still allow them to earn money, but it doesn't allow for the same wealth creation. It doesn't allow for the same social space. So it can't play the same role. So it's a real loss for the community on a number of fronts. So that's the short story. <laughs> that's the, the short version of the story I want to tell you today. And now I'll provide some of the nitty gritty details. Um, or, or first I'll talk about some theory and then I'll provide the nitty gritty details to back up the story. So before I get in, into the details of the, the, the um, data, I want to talk about theories um, that help us understand what's happening in this, in this industry, in this neighborhood. So there are lots of theories and frameworks that have been put forth to help us understand the role of race and understanding how it, it, organize, it organizes our society. So there's theories like racial formation, colorblind perspective, critical race theories. I hope a lot of you've all heard of some of these theories. Well, the different theoretical frameworks are useful and they all have unique strengths and weaknesses in helping us understand what's going on in society. But the most insightful studies done on race and work, especially women's work, have utilized this theory called systematic racism. And systematic, ra systemic, or sorry, systemic racism is a theoretical framework which uh, argues that racial oppression is a systemic core element of the functioning of American society. And systemic racism helps us understand the exploitations of blacks by whites in American society by helping us see how it's constructed and legitimized. And the importance of systemic racism versus other theories and frameworks is that it historicizes racism and embeds it into a local context. So, th so that's why it becomes very useful in this kind of study. Um, and, it, and systemic racism suggests that it becomes legitimizes through, legitimized through the use of what we call race frames, which help shape the way that a racialized actor perceives themselves and racializes the other. Um, and so this, um, I'll help you think about this theoretical framework in a very concrete way in just a moment, in case you're like, what the heck did she just say? Don't worry. Uh, but before I help you do that, I want to suggest that while systemic racism is a theoretical framework that is very helpful for helping, for helpful in enlightening us on, in the ways that racism operates in our society, it's limited. And there's this woman who's looked at, um, at women entrepreneurs and especially women in the beauty industry, and she suggests, hey, you can't just look at systemic racism, it is gender. So you have to look at systemic gendered racism. If you leave the gendered off, you're missing the picture, okay? And let me ex show you concretely how this um, s systemic gendered racism helps us understand the way that uh, race operates in society. So this, this is something I just threw together and I put, to, put out, I, I divided um, our history into three periods. Um, the first period represents uh, the pre-Civil War period. The second periodization represents uh, Jim Crow. And the third is post-Civil Rights era. And you, you're, you could do a Civil Rights era in there too. But this is just to help you concretely utilize or think about how to utilize this theory. So if you think about each of these time periods, you can, think, you can identify the racial exploitation, the mechanism through which racial exploitation happens. So, during the um, pre-Civil War period, it was a, the, the, it, exploitation happened in a bodily form. It was, race, it was slavery. And the racial frame that was utilized to justify slavery was by um, identifying yourself as human and, these, and, non, and dehumanizing the, the other. And, and the result of that, if you're just looking at racialized, um, uh, systemic racial, ra racialized, uh, I'm sorry, if you're just looking at uh, race and not gender, you would say the result is slavery, or that's how you under, would understand slavery as this fundamental part of American society. But if you look at gender, women, um, the bodily exploitation of women also took the form of rape. And you miss that if you don't add gender to the picture. And the same if you look at, you know, during the Jim Crow era, it was more legal and, um, and the um, justice system <laughs> was, it was used and continues to be used for racial uh, oppression in the society. And the framework that people used, whereas, and still use often, is inferior and superior. 
And the result, again, if you're only looking at race, you would say it's segregation during Jim Crow. But if you, it's really, segregation is gender, right? Men suffer incarceration, women get segregated into a, a, a very uh, low, page, low paid, specific type of work, and in specific spaces, too. And then if you look at it on the civil, during the post-civil rights era, which would be now, <laughs> You can argue that it's that they, there's cultural frames that are used, and uh, and the mechanism is cultural. So uh, black men get defined not as men; they are the op not not the opposite, but they are just not men. So so it would be breadwinners versus criminals, and the same thing that black women are not are defined as not being women, um, and they don't meet the ideal notions of femininity. And this really is um, participation. Hill Collins' work, if any of you know um, Black Feminist, who talks about this. So um, this is a way in which um, using this concept of a systemic gendered racism helps us really identify and understand the way that race organizes and operates in society. And this is helpful for looking at uh, what's happened in this neighborhood, in this industry, because um, Basically, the, the author, the, the woman who added, said we need to look at gender, she said, look, because she studied women who started businesses, especially black women, working class women, and, she, and many people who look at women who start businesses ask, why do, entrepreneur, why do immigrants have this very high rate of entrepreneurship and, and blacks in America have a very low rate of entrepreneurship? And she said, look, you cannot um, that this you can and, and you can that the diff, the different historical backgrounds of these groups need to be taken into account. And so, if you want to understand entrepreneurship with these groups, then you have to understand that background. So, scholars who have studied it, uh, um, who have studied entrepreneurship among immigrant uh, immigrants have suggested that there's what what they call an ethnic uh, enclave economy. This is like Chinatown, right? And so that's why they have been so successful. And so this woman suggests, hey, there's all, there's a, we should be using the term racial ethnic enclave because there's this whole historic history of race and the way it operates and gendered race, um, the way that gender and race operate that's different for immigrants. And what's, the, what's really nice about the story that I'm gonna show you in this industry in detail is that it captures very clearly the way in which race, ethnicity, and gender operate and um, have very different uh, repercussions for the actors in this, in this industry. Um, so you'll see um, the, how that plays out differently and, and so um, for each of these um, groups in, the, in, the, um, in this industry. So another important piece of analytical leverage we get for when we think about systemic gendered racism is it highlights uh, a paradox about this uh, about this industry and really about the the, Af the black salon or African American women um, salon salons that were started by African American women in that these salons emerge out of a society out of this systemic gender racism. It is because black women are forced to discipline and control their hair in certain ways to meet mainstream expectations that this industry even exists. And so, um, and the salon, so that creates the industry and the salon in some ways is very much helping to reproduce that. But at the same time, it also challenges so, and it challenges it in those important ways that I talked about at the beginning. It creates alternative economic uh, pathways to economic independence, for, especially for working class women, which is crucial. Um, uh, they create, it creates alternative streams of resources and power for black communities, and it's creating um, safe women-only spaces for women. So it, in these ways, it actually challenges the, um, the environment which it's reproducing. So it's a paradox. It, it, so, and only when you think about systemic gender racism will you realize that there's this underlying paradox of this um, in, in this industry. 
And so, um, let's see. So, I want, so given that background, I want to talk about, um, I want to give you the nitty gritty about this neighborhood. So the first thing I should t talk about is my data and why D-Town. And really, I chose D-Town for a number of reasons, many of which I'm not going to tell you about. But the main reason is that it is a neighborhood in Detroit that sort of is typical in many ways. And actually, when you look at some of the data in terms of the demographics and whatnot, if you, know the if you did know the neighborhood, and some of you might, it, I was kind of surprised because I thought it would fare worse than Detroit. It would be slightly worse off than the, av than the Detroit average. But it's actually slight be slightly better than the Detroit average in the sense. So uh, what I've done is I've just g given some rough demographic information for the neighborhood so you can see how it compares to both Michigan and Detroit. And so this neighborhood, actually, the income is slightly higher than the Detroit, um, than the average Detroit income. And also, the um, education rates are slightly higher. Um, the race breakdown is roughly the same. And it represents about 4% of Detroit's population. It's about 25,000 people in this neighborhood. And so, and the employment rates are roughly the same as Detroit. It's a, uh, uh, so there's slightly more employment. Um, but Detroit and this neighborhood have almost doubled the unemployment rate than the national average or Michigan, right? So it's very typical in many ways. And so, um, and then just very quick on the, uh, this data for the licensing data, um, I, as I suggested, I have three different kinds of data, uh, three different kinds of licensing data, licenses issued to individuals for cosmetology, and then shop and barber shops. And I have it for all of Detroit and then um, this neighborhood, which we call D-Town. And, um, and then also, I just wanted to see how, what percentage of the industry was represented in the neighborhood, and it's about 3%. And, given, and so the neighborhood represents 4% of Detroit. So it's not a mecca of business, but it's not totally devoid of business either um, or of the, for this industry. And then the survey that we've conducted, uh, and again, we can go in more in depth in any of the data that you want to ask more about. Um, we, have na we now have 50 surveys that have been done in this particular neighborhood. Um, and the, the respondents are slightly older and more female than the general neighborhood demographics. So there is a skewing going on in that data a little bit. And then I, I pulled from four different qualitative interviews, um, although I have a couple more, but for today's purposes, I pulled from these um, qualitative interviews. So that's the data. Um, the, first, uh, se the first thing, as I suggested, uh, the number of s registered storefront salons in Detroit has um, declined significantly. Uh, and and really, the three that are left are even beyond the outskirts of the neighborhood. So you could almost say they've completely disappeared. And this is my artwork. I'm trying to keep it an anonymous neighborhood, so I have to black everything out. But the red are, are commercial thoroughfares, and the center part of the, the neighborhood is, is gray. And you can see the, the blue and the purple pins are from the past. And today's pins are red. So the one way up there on the left, normally you wouldn't even count that. So really, there's one that's really operating within the neighborhood um, at this point. So there's been this significant decline. And this matters because when we present, when I, when I present at other parts of this project, and I say that the, the, that, that the storefronts have dis storefront salons have disappeared, I always have somebody who says, Hair care has always been informal, and they dismiss the fact that it was ever formal and that there were ever storefronts. And yes, there's always been an informal sector of the hair care industry, but what we don't want to dismiss is that there was once a very thriving formal storefront in part of the industry, too. So it's really key um, to be able to say, yeah, there was. And this is a comparison with the barbers and the, and the salons. And you can see the barbers are the blue. And they, they have declined a bit, but they are still quite a presence in the neighborhood. And, um, and you see them, and you feel it when you're in the neighborhood. And they also are more along, more in the neighborhood rather than just on the outskirts. Um, 
So here you can see how gender really matters, right? That, that, that whatever's happening in this industry is hitting these women in a way that's not hitting the men. And, and then as a, uh, oops, let me see, let me catch up with myself. Okay, so um, as the salons disappear, the barbershops decline a little bit but maintain their, maintain their presence, as I suggested, there's been an emergence of braiding shops. And really, these braiding shops are owned by the Senegalese males, staffed by the females. And the immigrants from Senegal only started in, by the females, only started in the 1980s. And really, it was a result of the, um, this amnesty laws of 86, which allowed women to become reunited with their husbands. And since then, there's been a flow of single women to come, or students, or step migration. But originally, it starts in the, in, in the 80s. And then this immigration flow happens at the same time you have what's known as the hair revolution, where you have a lot more diversity and kinds of hairstyles happening for black women. So there's two different things happening there. Um, and, 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 and these women uh, fill that um, space. The other part, the other important thing I wanted to know is that the Senegalese are part of a larger sub-Saharan African immigration flow that's emerging in the United States, and uh, which has doubled every decade since 19, uh, the 1980s. Still very small considering overall migration, but it's not, um, but it's growing quite quickly. And um, in Michigan, our trends here mirror, mirror what's happening on the national level. So there are about 30,000. African immigrants in Michigan. And there are at least two um, little Africas <laughs> in Detroit, and maybe more, two that I know about, where these migrants are um, tend to, to settle and, and congregate. And so, um, so the salons and the braiding shops, as I alluded to, are quite different, right? Um, these braiding shops, uh, the salons really are part of what this woman calls the racial uh, ethnic economy and comes out of this historical background. The braiding shops uh, would be, in the literature, defined more as ethnic uh, middlemen um, who connect. An ethnic uh, simple definition is these are the people who do jobs that are considered low status and connect the masses with the elite. And now you'd say braiding is not low status, because but actually among Senegalese in their country, it was always the low class lowest caste that, of women that did it. It's changing, but it, so, that, so it was associated. So, so they sort of followed that prototype. It's owned by men, owned by African immigrants, low startup costs, not licensed, and the providers. And, and really important here is that they are Senegalese women who speak their native language and then French. So English is their third language usually. They don't speak the language. The culture is very different. Um, than American culture, and they also have a very different religious background. Usually they're Muslim. And their main customer base are African American women. So um, the, imagine the difference in a salon versus a braiding shop. You go into a salon, and it's just busy, and people are talking and chatting it up, and the phone's ringing, and there's just all this activity, and you know, and there's women just crowded a lot of times, people in and out, and and, and they're doing all kinds of stuff, and it's just a real sense of vibrant activity and community. You walk into a braiding shop, and it's quiet, and there might be a few people sitting there. Um, there's usually just chairs and a mirror. There's not a lot of decoration. It's a, there's not a lot of communication. And, and so it's two totally different environments. So when I say the salon disappearing is a loss of a community institution, is a loss of very important cultural and social space, this is really important because it's, the salon does not replace that because of these differences. And also, I think for many people, I tell people, oh yeah, the salon's disappearing. And they're like, what are you talking about? Salons everywhere in Detroit. I'm like, no, what you see are braiding shops. <laughs> the salons are disappearing, but we don't see it. We don't notice it because these braiding shops are popping up everywhere. And to the, on, to the person that's not involved with this community, it's interchangeable. And, if, and what I'm suggesting is that they are not interchangeable, and the shift represents significant, uh, has significant repercussions for the community. And here's just, again, a lot of, I have a lot of great pictures, but I can't use them because of IRB, but these are shots from the outside, and I blocked off the names. And on the left, you can see these are the, the braiding 
salons, and they always have sort of like mag trade magazine posters uh, all over the windows. You can't really see in. And, but the, the um, shop, the, the salons work really hard at creating a name, a brand, and an atmosphere, a following. So it's very, very different kind of vibe to it. And this is generalizations. There are braiding salons, and there are some that are mixed and whatnot. But these are just um, the general pattern in the industry. So again, to summarize the data that I've shown you before, um, so far is that the braiding shops um, have increased significantly from zero to dominating um, the field out the, the industry. The barber shops have declined slightly but remain and the salons uh, have declined significantly with virtually um, no presence. So you can see the differences in race and gender and ethnicity and how they play out in this industry. And then that leaves us with one last um, important question here, which is, well, what happened to these women? Because you all look good, so I know you get your hair done. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, it, and like I suggested, um, the data shows first that women are still doing hair in the neighborhood. And not only are they still doing hair in the neighborhood, but this is not precarious, part-time employment that you go in and out of. These are women who have maintained their licenses often for 10, 20 years in the neighborhood. And so they, um, you know, and to maintain your license, you have to renew every two years. You have to stay in good moral standing because there's a question right on the form which asks you, how, do you have any legal problems? Have you been convicted, blah, blah, blah. I they get the exact wording, but if you have any kind of problem like that, you could, have, you could potentially have an issue with getting your license renewed. And then you have to pay a fee. So it's not something that's, you know, that's not without cost. So these women are maintaining their licenses, but you, they could be working in other neighborhoods, but we know they're not. We know some of them are still working in this neighborhood because again, in our survey in the neighborhood, we found that the top used informal service is hair care. So we know women are still doing hair there, and we know they're doing it in the kitchen salons. And so that what has happened is that they have changed Space. They have moved from the storefront to their homes, to the kitchens. And this shift in changing of space is very significant because the salon is not just the pl a place where your customer comes in, you do the hair. It plays all of these other roles. And also, you can't get booth prices <laughs> in your house, <laughs> so you earn less too. So the, 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 art, the craft of doing hair gets devalued when it's done from the home. And they have the loss of, of all of the other benefits and resources that the salon brings uh, to them um, in, in the hair being done in the salon. And so the, that begs the two, two last questions that I, I deal with is, is one, why have women shifted to the home? Why have they changed spaces? And two, what are the implications, right? So why, in interviews, there are three really important um, factors. One is that um, the challenge from these immigrant uh, entrepreneurs in the braiding has definitely had an impact. And there's um, licensing, uh, licensing wars going on in the sense that some states have, have made braiding have required braiders to be licensed with the state. And licensing, there's a whole literature on licensing, and licensing is a way for you to create a profession and to police that profession and keep the boundaries of the profession, which keeps the um, working conditions and, 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 and wages higher because not anyone can enter, so it, 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 it affects the competition level. And there's a whole literature that which proves that. <laughs> and so what's happened is in states where it's not, braiders aren't required to license, it makes it easier for them to infiltrate the marker, mar market and really put these salons out of, out of um, business. In some states, the, they're, they're, it's a salon and braiding is just one of the services you could offer. It could be the only one you offer, but it's still considered a salon, it has to be licensed. So that's one of the challenges. The other problem um, is that there's a lack of startup. And, and, and when, when one of the things is that, it, is, is that the shift from formal to informal is generational. And so the new generation, um, the older generation, when they started their salons, they never, no, they never get loans. They never go to a typical 
financial institution. All of their money is gathered from their social networks. And so the black middle class in Detroit really got hit with the shift of the auto industry, the, especially black work, upper working class, right? And so that left less resources uh, for startups like this. And the, what was left went to men, men control the resources. So men are not facing the hit as much as women are. It's a very gendered process that's happening. And then um, also the, another uh, factor is the de declining infrastructure which supports businesses in the city, which we underestimate. But things like lighting and street repair, a lot of the, the women talk, both in the field work and in the interviews, talk about how they, they are women-owned businesses with women patrons, and they are targeted by criminals in ways that the men are not. And so without the safety of lights and security of the police force and that stuff, that, that really hits their businesses. And again, it's a gendered process where they get hit in a much different way than the male businesses get hit. So those are some of the reasons that we're uncovering for this, sh this, this shift. And then finally, just a few words about um, the implications uh, of the changing spaces. Again, I, I feel like a lot of times when I present this, this phenomenon to people, they're very dismissive. Like, oh, women always work out of their house. It's more convenient. The salons aren't convenient. The women own and offer them. They decide when they're going to come and go. I've seen women who own this lawn or has somebody come in and say, hey, honey, you take that, I've got to run. And she leaves her kid, and they're watching the kid. And it's a, the, even more convenient in some ways than working out of your house, because there's other women there who can fill in for you if you've got something to run and do, where if you're on your own in your house, you don't have that. So this, this logic that women have always worked out of their home, or it's more convenient, something they choose, I feel like they're really dismissing the importance of this, um, the formalized aspect, the formal uh, storefront salons, and the devastating loss that it represents to these black communities, and especially um, for black women and their families, right? So it's a loss of an important pathway for economic independence for, for working class women. Again, half of Detroit's businesses are owned by African American women, but most of those are middle class women in health and social services. So it's, this is an important pathway for working class women um, out of those crappy jobs that they get stuck in um, in the formal economy um, that has been closed, is getting closed off for them um, in the Detroit area, not necessarily across the country, but it's certainly here. And then also, it's a loss of an important resource for women in terms of uh, networking, business context, sharing information, resolving disputes, these salons uh, provide all of those kinds of activities and resources for women. So even women who don't own the salon benefited from the salon because they can meet other women there. They some, they'd be selling their wares there. You know, so the salon played a storefront role, a contact and information exchange, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's it's, it's a lost space. It's a loss. It's a loss of an important gendered social space in the community. Again, for nur nurturing and learning, that a lot of um, uh, uh, those violences done uh, to Black women, um, it's, this creates a space where it's protected and they can heal and be, feel nurtured, and um, because it's it's a woman's only space and often um, um, protected space. So, um, and finally, I think it has really serious implications, this changing of space, because as women go back into the homes and do their work at the homes, they're not seen as workers. They're only seen as mothers and wives. So as I go around this neighborhood, and I'm like, what do you, what, what do you offer for women workers? And I'm like, women workers. <laughs> so they only see women as mothers, because you see them at the school, the public space, you, in public spaces, they're mothers. They're in the schools. They're in the church. Or wives in the churches. They're walking to the store to get food to cook. But they're not. You don't see them in public spaces or in business storefront businesses. So you don't view them as women. And therefore, the resources that you allocate to help them are not to help them be workers or be business owners. So instead, they oh, we got tons of programs to help women. Childcare, da da da, and all of it is to help them be better mothers 
or better wives, none of it to help them with the work that they do because they are no, it makes them invisible as workers. And so I think it, it leads to this misallocation of resources um, that perpetuates keeping them in this, in this situation. Um, so I think the implications are quite significant. So I'm sorry that I speed, I speed talk <laughs> to dump all of this information on you. So I'll stop here. Um, thank you very much for your time and um, attention. Sarah has left a, a lot of time for questions and responses. Yeah. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the talk. Uh, Really interesting. Uh, well, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of the decline of uh, this line um, in this neighborhood, and perhaps the city as a whole, uh, is that the migration, our migration of life in the city of Detroit. So between 1990 and 2010, we had close to half a million folks, most of which were black, who left the city. Um, they are disproportionately leaving the people that had more resources than others that were leaving, these are people that are leaving. So, <clears throat> I mean, what I was thinking is that on the one hand, you also have a, the city is becoming less dense, and so you just have less people that can go to these shops to support these shops that would provide them with enough capital to pay licensing, licensing fees, pay the rent, uh, boots fees, whatever that would um, make it possible to have these shops open. I'm not sure what the out migration has been, the, the radius in which you were doing the work. But I was thinking that could have had some impact between the time period that you're looking at. Uh, the other thing is, I don't know how to measure this. I, I can only think about being in high school. You know, when I was in high school, almost all the black girls had straight hair. Now, it's, it's whatever. You know, like, it's like, I mean, you look around the room. I mean, you got everything going right now. Uh, so it seemed like, you know, and these are just two things that came to my mind. On the one hand, folks are leaving. On the other hand, there's kind of a, a cultural shift in terms of what's acceptable as well. And so the hair salon, from what I understand, I mean, it's very different than braiding, you know. So if you're going to get your hair straightened, there's just less of a customer base. At one time, all the girls, women, were getting their hair straightened. Now that's not the case. And then on top of that, the folks aren't there. So if you're like in Auburn Hills or Southwood or whatever, you may not go 30 miles or whatever to, to this spot to get your hair done. So those are just two things that just popped in my mind. Kind of what could have contributed to why there's less of the actual store plant in that area? Yeah, and I would say definitely I think both of those contributed. And I think the out migration especially is compounded because, it, like you said, it's some people with money who left, right? right? So, But if you, if it was just simply that people who left led to the decline of the industry, you should see it for the barbershops in the same way. Yeah, but I think, uh, I, mean, I don't know. I think this is probably, I don't right, know. But, I mean, I mean right? We, it shouldn't just be salons that disappear. Barbershops well, should disappear, too. I mean, but the difference, no, no. the difference, I mean, from, yeah. I, I have no idea. This is coming top of my head. I don't know. Right. Uh, but the, the hairstyles, I mean, I guess, man, we've gone through different hairstyles as well. But still, it's like, you, if a man, if a black guy, wants to have an afro, or a high top fade, or a ball fade, or whatever, you're gonna go to the barbershop, they can do all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is different from like getting a jerry curl from the 80s, you know? <laughs> but the thing is, it's all happening there. You get, you know, they're probably good jerry curl, we probably go to salon to jerry curl, but uh, high top, afro, the guys don't, you know, that's all done at the barbershop, pretty much. But for the women, if you're getting your hair straightened, and then you decide, I'm not gonna do that. You know, I'm going to get dreadlocks, or I'm going to have an afro, I'm going to do something different, <coughs> and you're, you're not going to that salon that's doing that, unless they provide additional services to, to do that. So this is just something I'm thinking in terms of just perhaps, I don't know how you would measure that in terms of like, you know, cultural shifts in terms of uh, uh, hairstyles. No, yeah, uh, yeah. And then the other thing in terms of people leaving is what, again, is the people that are leaving are the ones that have more resources. But these could be the people also, in addition to supporting the businesses, the ones that are starting businesses as well, that are also leaving. I don't know. I'm just, just yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I did look at year, the startup, the years, 
how many licenses were issued each year. And so, you know, you can, you, you can definitely see a difference in the salons versus the um, barbershops. Okay. So I would just argue, and I agree that the, it's the, the, there's no doubt that the hairstyles right. have changed. But generally, uh, you can get almost anything done in a salon. Okay. And then you have braiding shops that only do braiding because they can't do anything else. So that's where the division comes in. So I do think the braiders have hit um, the salons. But everything else and more is done in, in, in the salon, unless somebody else yeah. wants I'll to. I'll just add to that. I think one of the things to keep in mind is that a lot of salons and stylists are they don't like natural hair it's easier in their minds to do relaxers or to press it there's a significant markup to do natural to do yeah. quote natural hair yeah. so if it's seventy dollars for a relaxer and a hundred and twenty dollars for a press and curl mm. what you're doing is you're pricing people out you're making them feel unwanted um, and so that's so that so so to um, Kari's point, that's part of what's going on. So yes, there are larger economic forces, but a lot of the salons have refused to adjust and accommodate natural women, uh, the women making the shift towards natural hair. Exactly. Yeah. Or they've done it, but they do it with an attitude, so yeah. you don't go, you're like, I gotta go find someone who will do my hair. Yeah. Uh, without an attitude and without a significant markup. Yeah. So that's something that's going and on. And they're, they're now, you, do, you can get a license as a natural yeah. 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 But the thing is, is that it's, it's, it's the stylists who don't often don't want to make the change. Yeah. Some of them are coming around now, but it's after it's after offending women for 10 years and women are doing hair on their own That's right. or they found like another place to go. So, you know, on the one hand, as someone who used to relax my hair and then who went natural, um, who went back to my natural state, and who's gone through this, you know, for me is, I might go to the salon only a couple of times a year, mm -hmm. but it's, only, you know, so certainly less than the eight weeks that other, you know, the other women had gone. So I'm empathetic to their situation, but I also know that some of this is self-inflicted wounds. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'm really empathetic, but it's, as someone who's gone through this in the past uh, 15 years, I've been frustrated by their refusal to adjust and to address the need. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, another thing I noticed that there are more and more hair care products um, that are sold on the shelves um, because a lot of women are now uh, embracing their natural hair texture that you can do this from home now. There are so many companies right. who are transitioning their hair care products so it accommodates women who wear their hair natural. So there's no need for them to go to the salon. Um, yep. And this trend is growing. I mean, there's blogs and um, YouTube, videos. YouTube yep. videos that uh, do it yourselves that show you how to care for your hair at That's home, right. especially if you would like to uh, shy away from, exactly. you know, the the chemical uh, texturizers and things right. like that. Right. So I think right. this trend and the fact that these uh, hair care product companies are being more pers uh, persuasive towards uh, women who are trying to transition their hair back into its natural state. So this could play a big role in the fact that why these salons are declining because a lot of these women who uh, do hair in the salons, they may claim that they know how to do natural hair, but a lot of them don't. And so, or you get the attitude, well, I really don't want to have to deal with your nappy hair or things like that. So a lot of women are like, okay, I'll just do my hair at home. And of course, these product, these companies are supporting that. So, I mean, I think that plays a big role in. Why? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm one of the other things that makes me interested in it um, is that it's not happening everywhere, according to other scholars. And according to other scholars, places like Atlanta, mm -hmm. the hair, the hair salons aren't flourishing. Mm -hmm. So why? Because is Atlanta style is shifted. <laughs> yep. okay. They are willing to accommodate. Okay. Exactly. Right, right. <laughs> right. So I mean, there's something. So I know there's something yeah. happening here yeah. that n isn't necessarily happening across the country. Mm -hmm. um, so, like you said, how to measure that? I don't know. But <laughs> yep. Uh, I knew a woman that, uh, years ago. Uh, in my community. She was African-American hairstylist. She was phenomenal at doing things. She did them from her home, then she moved to, like you say, a little storefront thing, and then she, she did so many things. She was a leader. She was a community leader. She was a, 
uh, she, she would gather a bunch of women and, and, and they would do a whole bunch of things. And I got to see all of this. She passed away a couple of years ago and I kept being amazed at how many things she was doing at once. She was like a leader, she was a community leader, she was a, she did so many different kinds of things, but we always she always got known as a hairstyle. But she did so many things at once. Is this what you were talking about? Was this as a as a kind of way of not only community building these women did, but they also did a lot of other roles too? Well, yeah, they do do other roles, but really I focus on really understanding the role of the space. Like you can't take have these women move back into their kitchens there's a, and, and not lose something beyond just an economic opportunity. There's something much greater that's being lost. Um, and that this actually bringing these women together in a, a woman-only uh, space that's nurturing. Um, there's a big loss there. And so I was focused more on space, but definitely there's a lot that one person does a lot and a lot of people doing a lot. I mean, they're very uh, vibrant spaces. Generally speaking, Michelle. Sure. Um, thank you. Your perspective is really interesting. Um, I was wondering, do you, do you get the sense in speaking with women who now have the uh, kitchen salons, like, do they feel pushed? Like, what is their perception that they're pushed out of the storefront, or that they made this choice that was going to be beneficial to them to move forward? I think it's different depending on the generation. So I think the older generation felt pushed. Um, like they just had it. You know, it's like they just reached a boiling point and they're just like, screw it, I'm not dealing with all this. I'm just going to do some choice customers out of my kitchen. And then the younger generation, they have an idea that they're going to have a salon at some point. Even though they might never get there, <laughs> it's still this idea that you will get there, even though they, you know, they could be, have been doing hair for 13 years and they still aren't, you know, you know so I think it's different from the generation. No? Um, one of the other things that might impact the data a little bit, uh, as the state of Michigan is uh, working through this whole question of marijuana uh, distribution centers and so forth, um, if we were to go, move forward a uh, few years and see what the impact of the location issues are, especially in terms of uh, uh, barber shops, because there's a second product that tends to follow some of the barber shops mm -hmm. that uh, is fairly lucrative and has uh, an ability to, you know, make those shops be a little more sustaining and so on and so forth. You know, so mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah. I, and, and you don't see the same kind of trade necessarily in the uh, in uh, hair salons, primarily because of differences in terms of security. You know, so I, I would just think, give it a little more time, and uh, let's see if those numbers hold up yeah. in terms of them disappearing, uh, uh, male versus female uh, status. Yeah, that's really an interesting point, actually. Um, well, we've talked about, you've talked about, like, both directions of migration in and out of the area. So I'm guessing it's just not just the uh, Savala immigrants that are, like, um, might be crowding some of these women out, you know, or the, like, any other comments you have to offer about, like, say, any kind of possible shift in demographics of other types that might be um, affecting this? Filling in, in the market, you mean, in this? Actually, no, it's very interesting because... Um, you know, part of what made the industry was that it was black women doing black hair, that part of the segregation created this because, you know, the, the needs were not met in the, norm, in, the, in the mainstream economy, so there was this need, and, um, and the women were getting crappy jobs in the mainstream economy, so it was like this, the paradox is what created it. So it was a protected economy in a protected market in that sense, but um, so it's very, in, the, the Senegalese immigrants are very interesting because they're, Af they're African. So they are, so you don't have the, 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 the racial, the, the racial enclave um, is, is uh, 
violated and not violated, right? Because it's the, the it's still black women doing black hair, but it's now not Africans, it's immigrants that are doing it. So doing something that no other demographic could do in a sense. Yeah, actually there was no so I mean they had the half the braids names of braids are from Senegal because this these women who brought this style and um, really popularized it uh, in America. It's kind of fascinating story. The whole hairstyle stuff is very fascinating beyond just the industry itself. I think that though salons, yeah, anyway, we can have longer discussion about this in a different forum. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But no, no so influence, other immigrants, no. So no influx or gentrification well, or anything like that? So, uh, no, but this is a typical Detroit neighborhood. It's not a bit town neighborhood. <laughs> so, is it, so there's some, uh, you know, there's yeah. definitely stabilization, less outflow, I would say. But there's not like a huge gentrification. Those hundred homes. Yeah, there's like a very small little <laughs> Two blocks. You know, <laughs> there's a few goat raisers, but not too much. Any other? Yeah. Just a comment. I really do like how you highlight the fact that it is a very uh, community-oriented space. Um, um, I, as a multicultural male myself, and being in a, in a a barber shop or whatever the case may be, um, it is a space where you can learn things, where you get to. Uh, be able to you have to experience different cultural things like you can learn from you know, the elders who work there or have experience or frequent the place so I do I do value that point and I think that the way that you demonstrate that in your research is actually really important because as these salons are being taken away it does take away from the community as well and so I, I really do like that point and I like how you argue that throughout your research mm -hmm. Hopefully somebody with some power will listen. <laughs> and I'll just say, I agree. And as someone who shifted away from salons, I miss it, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you maybe if, if they can, if they can, right. I, and I think that. that, that they come correct. Right, right. Away. I think that Atlanta shows that there's a model where this can continue to flourish. And I think really is crucial for the community. Um, I mean, there are very few natural hair salons who salons that actually cater to natural textured hair, and I feel like they um, tend to accommodate. Not only they they have women in there that know how to braid, they have women in there that know how to texture, you know, change the texture of your hair and things like that. I feel like if these, uh, you know, the normal beauty salons, the ones that just started out, would accommodate and learn how to incorporate some of these new things. Then I think they would do better. Yeah, they would thrive. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, it might be a period of uh, of um, where it's you know they're going to adjust and accommodate, and you'll see a flourishing yeah. again. Um, so that's very possible. And I've seen some that have done yeah. that. And I have to say, in Detroit, there are these uh, meetups yep. that yeah. that are that blow my mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a, I've never seen so many black women in one space. They could take over the city, and. Um, so that could also be an alternative social space, especially if it becomes more popular and more regularized, and it could potentially replace the salon as that social space. So that's another path we might see it take. I'm just not sure. 